This is what Jesus said when he got up on the mountain and started preaching. You've heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good. He sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Aren't even the tax collectors like that? And if you only greet your own people, what are you doing more than the others? Don't even the pagans do that? Lord, that's a strong word, and we need your help to understand it. I ask that you would receive these praises this morning. A collection of your people crying out that we need you. That's the honest truth. We need you. We don't have a whole lot that we're bringing to the table. We bring open hands. We bring expectant hearts. We bring the very best of our intentions, but even those are confused. We need an awful lot from you today. We pray that you would enter this place and speak to us fresh and new on passages we've read a a hundred times maybe. Things that we've thought about, but we need help today. We're going to need help tomorrow. Give us a word, Lord. We love you. Amen. Great worship. Some of you have noticed we're all spread out up here. You know why? Because we're going to baptize today. We're going to baptize today. We're, uh, this is the second sermon in the series called Us, which I realized essentially what it is, if I refer back to the description last time, is last word. That's another way I could have phrased this. That's what the series title could have been. It's last word. It's if I had to say one more thing on a topic, what has God laid on my heart that just burns? It's only by kind of coincidence that all of the last words, the things that I think, man, God has really fired me up for this idea, they all have one thing in common, and it's us. And so it's called us. Today's is I, thou, which some of you have seen maybe and wondered what's going on here. I don't know. We'll find out. (laughs) I want to just read some things to you. I'm going to tell you why I say I don't know. I I actually don't know. This is baffling. I'm just going to run through some scripture real quick. You tell me if you can wrap your head around this. You don't need to flip. I'm going to go too fast. You don't need to flip there. I just want you to, 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 to listen to these texts and think about I and thou, my relationships, and what the Bible tells me to do in my relationships. That's all I'm asking. Listen to these. We're going to go all the way back to Exodus. If you come across your enemy's ox or donkey wandering off, be sure to return it. If the, you see the donkey of someone who hates you, Fallen down under its load, do not leave it there, but be sure to help them with it. Let's skip forward to Leviticus. Do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against anyone among your people, but love your neighbor as yourself. Now skipping to Deuteronomy. Do not seek a treaty of friendship with them as long as you live. Ezra says it again, do not seek a treaty of friendship with them at any time. But then we get this in Proverbs. If your enemy is hungry, give him food to eat. If he's thirsty, give him water to drink. Then we read what we just read here in Matthew on the Sermon of the Mount. You've heard that it was said, love your neighbor. If I even move backwards, you've heard it was said, eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. This morning, it was just Ruby and I who were awake, and I read that to her and explained what it meant. And then I kept going, and I said, but I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, I said, what do you think, Ruby? And she said, slap them on the left cheek. (laughs) We got some work to do still. (laughs) Turn 
turn to them the other cheek also. And she, she did not agree with this part of the Bible. I'm not going to turn my other cheek when they slap me on the right cheek. I tell the teacher. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. If you flip forward to the, the book of Acts, these are confusing. The book of Acts chapter 5, there is a, con, a relational contention that happens between Peter and Ananias and Sapphira. Anybody know who loses that one? They died. You move forward to just uh, Acts chapter 8, and there's a disagreement between uh, Peter and the disciples and a man named Simon. Simon lost that one too. In fact, today, what Simon was doing was he was using his power that was given to him by the Spirit for his own advantage. And so today, if God, the Holy Spirit, gives you some power and you use that to make money, that's a heresy called simony, named after him. What a legacy he left. So where does that fall in our instructions for how to have challenged relationships? What about the book of, Ma of Luke that says, On the cross, Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And then in Acts 7, Stephen said the same thing. As he was being stoned to death about the people who threw the stones, he said, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And then he died. I think what we can say is our relationships, our relationship with relationships is complicated. The Bible gives lots of different instructions. And one of the reasons, just to make sure you understand, that I'm able to read texts that appear to be all over the spectrum and don't even agree is because I didn't read the context. I only read one little statement, which makes it look like the Bible gives a lot. It's okay to either disagree with them so much that they die. It's either, it's okay if you disagree with a, a heresy to be named after, but don't hold that sin against them, but don't make a treaty with them. But, well, I didn't read any context there. What we do know is our relationship with relationships is complicated, which is not something that you just learned from me. You knew that before you even came in here this morning. Relationships are complicated. Most of us don't have enemies, though. That's kind of the hard part of this. A lot of these verses in the Bible are, even Jesus said, love your enemies. If we were really strict with our definition of the word enemies, do you really have any? I mean, you maybe have people that you don't get along with that well. Could you say that somebody that rubs you the wrong way is an enemy? I don't. I don't. I mean... People that maybe make me feel a certain way, I wouldn't call them an enemy. What do we do with just relationships with people that are strained? What do we do with relationships with people that there's some history there? That we bumped heads one time and we never said we're sorry and it just kind of grew and now we just don't talk. What do we do in those relationships? The sermon is called I Thou because I have a fascination with a German philosopher and who wrote a book called I and Thou, and I'm not even going to talk about it. I'm skipping it entirely. What's the point? The point is this. When we see God in them, every part of our life changes. Everything changes. We recently uh, went trick-or-treating and last year was our first year trick-or-treating around our neighborhood, just kind of walking around and seeing how much candy we could get. And not much because that was the COVID year and there weren't that many people even doing it. This year, we discovered everybody was out on their curb, right out there. They were sitting in lawn chairs. Some people had music going. I was frantic with relational energy. I could not contain myself, and all the time I'm walking, all I'm thinking is, don't be weird, don't be weird, don't be weird, Nathan. <laughs> he was by himself. Like we... I was constantly catching up, because yeah. I would get in conversation with somebody, it was people that had a, a lazy boy in the garage, and I thought, let's talk about that. Hey, you got a lazy boy in your garage, and I started talking to them about that, because I wanted to connect with them, and that you don't get that many 
chances to do that kind of thing in American neighborhoods, do you? When everybody opens their doors and their garages, my, I was frantic. I couldn't believe it. For me, when I walk around a neighborhood and I see faces and flesh and the opportunity to connect with people, I, there are very few things that feel closer to heaven. I'm not overstating. But today's sermon, I believe that while it does connect to this idea of I want to see the best in you, I want to connect with my neighbor, I want to build relationships, how do we deal with strained relationships, I could also boil it down to this. Three steps to happier relationships. I think we all want happier relationships. I chose happier on purpose because you might have good relationships they could be happier. Three steps to happier relationships. Sometimes I give three something and it doesn't matter what order they're in, today it matters. Step number one has to be step number one. The first step, if you want happier relationships, is this. The image is in everyone. The image is in everyone. That's the first step. Genesis 1, 26. Then God said, Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, over all the creatures that move along the ground. Verse 27. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Image and likeness are two words for the same thing, just meant to strengthen the concept. The image of God is in everyone. Everyone, everyone. And I know for some, that can be hard. Uh, When I was in junior high, there was a jerk named Jeremy. Last name something. He wore dark clothes. He had a ring with spikes on his ring. And he just walked down the hall and bopped me on the arm. I thought, that's illegal. Man. He was so mean. He was angry at everybody. I don't think the image was in him. Do you have people in your life that you feel that way? Man, I believe the image is in everyone, except for, I don't see it. It's buried awfully deep if it is. Here's what we need to be able to say. Whether I like you or dislike you, whether I love you or hate you, the image is in you. Whether you love God or hate God, whether you live for God or live completely against God, the image of God is in you. I see the image in everyone. What is the image? Well, there's different ways to, I can go about this the deep way. We can talk about this theologically. What I can tell you is that the theological answer to what is the image of God ends in mystery. There are some things that we can say, but really what's Is that the point of what we're talking about? If I were to say to you that your relationships with people hinge on whether you believe that the image of God is in them, the point is not really, well, can you define the image of God? That's not the point. The point is, it is the image of God, regardless of how much you understand about it. And so that elevates them. That's the point that I'm getting to. That elevates them. We need to live with an I see the image in you posture. I see the image in you, even if you don't. Think of someone in your life. Maybe it's your neighbor. Maybe it's a coworker. It's someone that you know that they don't see the world that way. 
There is a way to go about living that begins, your relationships with people begin with, I see the image in you, even if you don't. That's a posture. Jesus did this. Notice how he approaches the Samaritan woman in John 4. She had a self-perception. She had a community perception. He had a divine perception. And so he approached her and he broke every rule of society with his first words, will you give me a drink? In other words, you have everything you need to serve God himself. He saw into her what she didn't see into her. The quality of your relationships depends on your belief that every person is created in the image of God. I can even rephrase it. The quality of your life itself. The quality of your life itself depends on your belief that every person is created in the image of God. That's step one. The first thing is the image is in everyone. The second step to happier relationships The damage is not the image. The damage is not the image. So first, what I'm doing with that statement is I am not making an excuse for the way that that person has treated you or for the way that you've treated them. The damage is not the image. The image is in everyone, but the damage is not the image. What is damage? There's the old phrase, hurt people hurt people. Have you ever heard that before? Hurt people hurt people. Christians believe everyone is hurt. We are all fallen. For everyone is fallen short of the glory of God. Everyone is hurt. Everyone is damaged. The image is not the damage. And the damage is not the image. Ephesians 2 phrases it like this. Ephesians 2, 22 to 24. Sorry, Ephesians 4, 22 to 24. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires to be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. And notice the two words of distinction, created and corrupted. The image and the damage, created and corrupted. You were created in the image. You were corrupted with damage. And so were they. But their damage is not the image. Why is this important? We have to distinguish or else. I, I, can't, I can't highlight this point enough. This is what makes us different from every other worldview. The worldview says this. You are your brokenness. If you screw up, you are a screw up. We don't say that. We say you are created in the image of God and everything that you do less than that is your damage. God is always redeeming you back to his image. Therefore, everyone has hope. When I was in high school, I had a beautiful car. According to me. It was, a, it was an early 90s. Pontiac Firebird with T-tops. Yes. With a 305, and it was red. And I went really fast right after I saw Fast and the Furious in the theater. (laughs) Only little problem with it was on the front driver's side fender was a little ding about that big. So I got this beautiful piece of machinery for the price of (laughs) $3,500. The ding was not the car. Nobody would say, 
man, Nathan, you got a nice ding. They'd say, you got a nice firebird. It happened to have a ding. You are not your damage. They are not their damage. They and we and us and I and everyone are created in the image. We are not our damage. In Mark chapter 1, I know I'm moving a lot, but I told you that in the last sermon that because of the points that I'm making and that Scripture is consistent, I'm moving around a lot. In Mark chapter 1, Jesus gave us an example of this very thing. He spoke to the image in a demon-possessed man and distinguished the image from the damage. So he even called the damage out of the image. Watch this. Be quiet, Jesus said sternly, and if I can put it in quotes, to the damage. He spoke to the damage. Come out of him. This man's damage was an impure spirit. It says in verse 26, the impure spirit shook the man violently and came out of him with a shriek. That's the way that we are damaged. The damage is after the image, and Jesus calls it out. So his first act of ministry was to distinguish from our unlikeness to God. The man was not like God in his damage. And so Jesus, in his first act of ministry, was to call the damage out of the person. What does this look like in our lives? Also in high school, uh, I made, I don't even know why I did this, it was brainless. It was uh, after lunch, and I don't first we were walking out and uh, of the cafeteria, and there was that open thing of I don't know if they still do this at my school. They had an open thing of mayonnaise that was about that big, and a and I took a napkin roll and I just went <coughs> like that in the mayonnaise, and then threw it in the trash on my way out. Didn't think anything about it. Obviously, didn't even think that I I didn't it was brainless. The very next class was carpentry class with Mr. Wickham, who was a fatherly mentoring teacher to me. And he pulled me into his office and he said, Nathan, why'd you stick the napkin in the mayonnaise? And I just shrunk. I just shrunk. I felt stupid. I felt small. And he looked at me and he patted me on the shoulder and he said, you're way better than that. Go back to class. You're way better than that. Go back to class. That was a person in my life who saw that I was better than my damage. I wasn't my mis- I made a mistake, but the mistake was not everything about me. At some point, all Christians have heard, every Christian has heard, you are better than that. That's why you're a Christian. Because when you heard that, when you heard you're better than that, at least one time you believed it. And on the other side of that was salvation. And you've been living in the better than ever since. Redemption requires an imagination. My damage is not his image. My damage is not his image. Can you say that to yourself about yourself? My damage is not his image. You feel great saying that about yourself. You must say it about your neighbor. You must say it about your coworker. Your damage is not your image. I don't even care if you hate God. Your damage is not your image. You can reject God, but you were created in His image. And I'm so sorry you were damaged. Me too. But somebody told me once, whether it's from a pulpit or on my couch, that I'm better than that. And I believed them. And you are too. First, the image is in everyone. I'll go so far as to say if you can't say the image is in everyone, you can't have happier relationships. 
you will continue to be more and more angry and critical and cynical of this world and the people in it. If you believe the image is in everyone, that's the beginning of hope. Second, if the image is in everyone, the damage isn't the image. Third, love the damaged because of the image. So point number one means that the worst to ever live, fill in the blank. The worst people to ever live were created in the image of God. But point number two means the image of God can become so damaged that it barely looks human anymore. And we refer to them, people that fall that deeply into their damage, as evil and vile. We just can't go so far as to say that they are no longer created in the image of God. So the question is this, how could we possibly love our enemies? Or better, what do we love about them? If someone, their damage has really hurt us or impacted our lives, how could we possibly say, I love you? I want to just make a caveat that I understand that damage can abuse, it can traumatize, it can scar, and it can create new damage. Damage causes damage. But the question remains, how can we love damaged people? And I am not referring primarily to your mean neighbor, to your cruel coworker. I'm referring to us. How can we love each other? Because when you came this morning, that was one act of God continuing to redeem the damage out of your image. And so we are all trying to love each other, trying to invest in one another, trying to see into and inspire and eulogize and talk up one another. And we're doing that while our damage is causing damage. And you realize, I was just trying to be nice. Man, she's cold. So at the same time, we're trying to be warm. Our damage causes damage. How do we do this? Jesus did it. Let's follow his example. These are very quick. Uh, I'm going to give you a R-I-G. You rig the relationship. You rig it. R-I-G. Be realistic. That's R. Love looks like a lot of things. Be realistic. If someone is currently doing something to you, maybe now is not the time to try and say something really nice. Thank you. Can I have another? Be realistic. Understand the, the, the current, very complicated dynamics of your relationship. There's only so much that you can do. It's hard to do things uh, between genders. Be respectful of private spaces. Be respectful of crossing gender. Be realistic in, in your relational interactions. But the best question, in my opinion, is what's the healthiest thing? You are going to have reactions to your relational dynamics where somebody says something to you, something happens, and you are going to probably just shoot from the hip. Don't shoot from the hip. Pause and ask yourself, what's the healthiest thing? What's the healthiest thing to do right now? And what I want to tell you is if you will just pause and say, what's the healthiest thing? You may find yourself turning around and going back into rooms where your feelings were just hurt to bring salve to the relationship. You may find yourself renewing old conversations that have hurt you for years and you want to go back and fix it. You may find yourself in healing in relationships that you thought that they're just always going to be that way. Because rather than shooting from the hip... You're saying, what's the healthiest thing? Number one, be realistic. Number two, be intentional. Everything on purpose. What do I want to cause in this relationship? Think about someone that's in your life and the relationship's a little awkward, a little strained. Maybe it's a little damaged. Maybe there's some hard feelings. 
When you go into that relationship and you want to love the damaged person, how do you love them? R-I-G, first, be realistic. Second, be intentional. Third, be generous. More time, more chances, more time, and more chances. In our home, whenever someone from the home comes back into the house and they refer to something that was said to them or something that somebody did, what do we often say? The things people do often say more about them than it does about us. So if somebody says in your life, they say, you are so ugly today. Wow, that's mean. Are you ugly? No, they're the kind of person that tells people they're ugly. Give them more time and more chances. Be generous with them. If we make that stuff soak deep into ourselves, some of the things that people said to Jesus were absolutely cruel, cruel and hateful. And what did he say? Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. That's generous. That is not giving a free pass. They are doing it. But I'm going to be generous in this relationship. You get Pass after pass after pass. He did this with Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus was a lying thief, a traitor. People commented. This is what people said about Jesus' interaction with Zacchaeus. He has gone in to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. That was their relational dynamic. How does Jesus love the damaged Zacchaeus? He didn't love that he was a sinner. That's the point I'm trying to make to you. You don't have to love the mean things people do in order to love them. Love the image within them even if you regret and deal with the damage that has come over them. If they have any hope of living beyond the damage that has happened to the image, they need you to have an imagination. And so it's not that Jesus ignored that Zacchaeus was a sinner and he didn't love that Zacchaeus was a sinner. He loved Zacchaeus out of his sin. And Zacchaeus completely changed his story. Today we're baptizing. God wants to cleanse the damage and reveal the glory of his image. And we call that redemption. Before I move into baptism, I just want to speak from my heart to you. When I came into your community, I became aware of different relational dynamics long histories, people, some we get along with these, we don't get along with others, and that's totally normal in every church. That's common. When I'm talking to you, my family, I love all of you. I love you. And I want for you to love each other. But you can't do that just by pretending that something didn't happen. You can't do it just by pretending you're getting along when actually they're really mean and they hurt your feelings when you spend time with them. You can't get along and be a loving community if you yourself allow the damage to cause damage. You're not listening when your family's trying to tell you, hey, tone it down, you're being harsh. I want to love you so much that you enjoy your relationships outside the church in your places of work and in your neighborhood, you haven't experienced the size of your property yet. If you have not found this kind of loving relationship with your neighbor, you know why? Because their yard becomes your yard. Your house gets bigger. If you work in a cubicle, your office gets bigger because you now know this person on a deeper, deeper, deeper level. How? Because you see the image in them. You see it right into them. And you become this baffling 
odd person in their life who loves them more and differently than anyone they've ever met. That's what I want for us. Baptism might be the most powerful act of image bearing. I thought if we're being really corny, we could wave goodbye to Lori right before we dunk her. <laughs> but do, do you get what I'm saying by that? We're, we're washing the damage off of Lori today. Do you, do you understand that? And so we wave goodbye to Lori. That's what we want for everybody. I don't care what they did to you. I care about your feelings. I care about how it made you feel. I care about the long-term impact that their damage had on your story, that you've had to work out the damage that other people have caused. I'm sorry, but the image is still in them. And we want to wash it off everybody today. That's the way we relate to one another. That is what it is to live in an I thou posture. I move through the world with I and thou. What's your name? What's your name? Do you know what it feels like to live that way? To walk up and you don't know their name. You don't know where they live. You don't know what their job is. You don't know what their hangups are. You don't know what their addictions are. And you don't know in what way they're going to cause you pain a year from now. What you do know is God made them. And God created them in his image. And you just move through the world that way. I want to see the image of God in you. And I want to be anything I can in your life. Or any sort of redemptive agent that moves you toward washing off a little bit of damage. There's life on the other side of that. Ephesians 4, as I read, refers to putting off the corrupted and putting on the created. That's what we're doing today. I'm going to put off the corrupted and put on the created.